you guys have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 10. We are going to be finishing up not only the chapter 11, but also this whole series, mini-series that we've been in, Genesis. Uh, if you know your Bibles, you're like, Mitch, what the heck, Genesis has 50 chapters. I know we decided we didn't want to be in one book for like seven years, so we're breaking it up a little bit. So we're going to bring this thing to a close, or at least take a break for an extended amount of time. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, at first glance, this passage, there doesn't seem to be much there. In fact, we're going to talk about that in a second as we intro this, but um, I just want to let you guys know I'm exceedingly excited about sharing with you uh, what I feel like was brought to light in the text this week, Uh, even though, as we're going to read, these first six words wouldn't lead us to think that something awesome is coming in the Bible. Let me read them real quick and I'll explain. Genesis 11, verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. Upon reading just these first six words in our text, most people would be tempted to tune out right now, like already 30 seconds in. I've read these before, Mitch. I think Sam alluded to this two two weeks ago. Uh, Most people, when they're reading through the Bible in a year, they get to these long genealogies, and then it just feels like you're walking in quicksand and it's not good for the soul. But um, those people that fall asleep only to be woken up when we're back in the good stuff would be missing something this morning. So guys, here's the reality about this text. Look, we're going to come across names that we can barely pronounce. I'm going to try my best. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I admit. We're going to learn more history that can seem distant or irrelevant to our current lives. But Uh, We are going to find eternal truth penned by a man, uh, led by the Holy Spirit this morning, preserved in the pages of these scriptures. I just want to remind you guys as we open to, just to kind of bring home this point, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he said, all scripture is breathed out by God. And that just says something about our church, right? We believe that. We believe that not one word is wasted. Not just the fun parts are breathed out by God, not just the easy to understand parts are breathed out by God, and not just the super applicable parts are breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God, and the remainder of the verse says, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So we were prepping for this. It kind of hit me that this text is not a John 3.16, and this by no means is something that you'd have on your fireplace, kind of for everybody to see as they enter your house. But it is nonetheless the very word of God. So uh, without saying any more, would you guys pray with me and ask God that he would open up our eyes to see his glory in this text and to grant us wisdom as we walk through it. Let's pray. God, we we approach this genealogy in humility, acknowledging that perhaps at first glance, we don't see very much, but, but we wanna take a minute to pause right now and just acknowledge how awesome it was and is that you've given us this book, that you've given us your word. We don't wanna gloss over any part of it. We wanna take every word seriously. And so this morning, help us to do this, Lord. Again, help us to see your glory in this text. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 10 again, we're going to read it all the way through. It says, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. After only one verse, if you've been with us through this series in Genesis, perhaps there are a couple names that look familiar to you already. The first being Shem, the second is Arpachshad. And and Shem's had a pretty big role in the scriptures up to this point. If you remember Noah and that whole debacle with his three sons where Ham uncovered him and Shem and Japheth covered him up. So we've, we've heard of him, but his name and his son Arpachshad's name are also a part of a genealogy in chapter 10, which is exactly what Sam walked us through a couple weeks ago. You can actually read it starting in verse 21 of chapter 10. If you want to turn there, you can. But it just says, To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam, 
Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. So again, in chapter 10, as, as Sam mentioned, what we get is this big picture view of all the descendants of the sons of Noah as the earth is repopulated after the flood. So that's why we see those names there as we get an account of all of Shem's sons. And at the very end of chapter 10, it tells us this very clearly. It says, and from these, the nations spread abroad on earth after the flood. So what's different about the genealogy in chapter 10 with the Tower of Babel story right in the middle and then we're right back here to Shem and Arpachshad? Why are both these names popping up and what's the difference between the genealogies? The genealogy in chapter 11 is concerned primarily only with one of Shem's son where the other record is just a broad sweeping. These are all the children that were born from these men. This one, it goes from Shem. It forgets about Elam or Asher or Lud or Aram, and it goes straight to Arpachshad. And they ask, the question that we need to answer is, why does this account zero on Arpachshad alone? And as I want you guys to see, and as we'll see as we walk through this text, that the author is bringing us somewhere. God is wanting to show us something in this genealogy. Or, to put it plainly, God is wanting to introduce us to somebody. Just as another genealogy in chapter 5 brought us from Adam down to Noah specifically, so this genealogy is going to bring us from Noah and his son Shem all the way down to one of the most prominent figures in the remainder of the Bible, whose name is Abram. With that said, we'll read through verses 11 through 32, and then we're going to come back, break it into sections, and see what nuggets of wisdom we can find there. Verse 11, and Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah, and Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug left after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor lived 29 years, he fathered Terah or Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And then verse 26, when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And so it is, church, that we get from Noah to Abram. We got Noah, Shem, Arpachshad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sarug, Nahor, Terah, and Abram. We're going to come back to this. Let's read in verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Mark that, that's going to be important later. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. And now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Verse 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. <clears throat> 
There are verses for the day, for the sake of the remainder of our teaching. We're going to be dividing this text up into three sections that we're going to examine one at a time. If you guys take notes, then you guys can write this down. They're quite simple. In verses 10 through 26, the two words I want you to write down are the bridge. The bridge. Verses 27 through 30. We're going to use something that Pastor Paul brought up or came up with, I think, or used, I don't know, stole from somebody. God uses the lowly to do the lofty, verses 27 through 30. And then finally, the awkward one, it's the journey to Canaan, dot, 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 that ended in Haran. So those are our three sections. We're going to jump into this text together, starting with the bridge. And if you're wondering why I'm using the word bridge, we mentioned this already, but as one Bible commentator said, what to us is just at first glance, a list of names was to God a bridge from the appointment of Shem to the call of Abram. So we look at verses 10 through 26 to start off with, and first and foremost, we need to look at the big picture, which I admit we've been doing a lot in the book of Genesis up to this point, but it's very good for us to keep this before us. The big picture is this. In verses 10 through 26, we see the continued faithfulness of God to fulfill his covenant promises. We see the continued faithfulness of God to fulfill his covenant promises. We've mentioned Genesis chapters 2 and 3 many times throughout this series, but I want to mention it one more time because when God came to Eve after the fall, and he's addressing Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he promised Eve that there would be a seed that would come from her that would crush or bruise the serpent, What we find as we read through the rest of Genesis is that God not only intended to do what he promised, but had the power to do so. But then at times, as we've read through our text, that promise looks like it's in jeopardy. Right? Adam and Eve have a couple kids, Cain and Abel, and right off the bat, Cain kills Abel, and thus it looks like, again, that promise might not be fulfilled, but then God gave Eve a new son, and his name was, does anybody remember? Seth. And as we learned in Genesis 5, it was through Seth's line that we get to Noah. And then Noah, of course, and his whole family were saved from the devastating flood, thus again showing God's power and grace and faithfulness to preserve a people for himself to ultimately do what he promised that he would do. Because as we just saw, the connection from Noah to Shem And then ultimately to Abram, whom God would make a covenant with for him to become the father of many nations. He was going to bless him so that Abram's nation would be a blessing to the world. That blessing ultimately would come down to a singular blessing primarily, which ultimately was that seed. Jesus Christ would come through Abram's line and bring blessing to the whole world as he opened up a way for lost and wicked sinners to be saved. And you find that genealogy from Abram to Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. So all throughout this text, you see Adam to Noah, Noah to Shem, Shem all the way down to Abram in Matthew 1, Abram to Jesus. God is providentially and sovereignly doing what he said he was going to do in bringing Jesus I love this quote. It says this, that the confusion of Babel in Genesis 11 could not thwart the plans to bring the snake crusher. The scattering of the nations could not thwart the plans to bring the promised snake crusher. As we read through Genesis, all we've seen is sin and more sin and more wickedness and more of God's grace. But all of the wicked, sinful world and cultures, they could not thwart the plan to bring the snake crusher. Again, the very first thing we want to see in this passage is God's continued faithfulness to fulfill his covenant promises to bring the snake crusher. And that's the first thing I want to say with these free verses, but we actually aren't going to leave these verses behind because I want to share with you guys a question that I was asking of the text as I was reading through these names beginning with Shem. Again, I don't want to gloss over anything and miss anything in the scriptures, so so what I found myself asking is the question, why? And here's what I mean. Upon reading this passage, 
You, you look at this family and you start to ask, why is it that God chose this family of all the families in the earth? In this specific genealogy, you see that God carefully selected certain sons from the families to get to Shem and Abram. Each of these names etched in the pages of Scripture, forever to be remembered and read about. And my question just kept coming to my mind. Why these guys? Like, how did these guys make themselves, I don't know, of use to the Lord in this way? How did these guys get used In this way, let me explain my dilemma. Hang with me. There's a lot of names, but I know we can get through it. First off, we have Noah, right? Noah was a righteous man in his generation. He was obedient. He was a man of faith, but we learn very quickly after the flood, the waters dried up, that he was too a flawed man. He wasn't the hero of the story. So we ultimately see that he found favor in the eyes of God. And then we have all three of his sons, and I already mentioned this, but you have Ham, who was the dum-dum, he decided to uncover his dad, and then you have Shem and Japheth, and they both together took the cloak and like walked backwards to cover their dad's nakedness, if you remember. But it's not Japheth and Shem that were blessed. Paul mentioned that Japheth gets a seat at Shem's table, but ultimately, the blessing goes from Noah down to Shem. The promised line would come through his descendants, not Ham's or Japheth's. And then it continues, right? We already mentioned this. Out of Shem's line, it wasn't Led or Aram or Shur, Elam's descendants uh, through which the promised snake crusher would come, but instead it was through Arpachshad. And then that actually continues down, right? As we read through, in the, in the line of Arpachshad, you have Eber, but Eber had two sons, Peleg and Joktan, but in our genealogy in chapter 11, we don't read about Joktan at all. There's a division there, and it's Peleg's line that is going to be the line that's blessed. And then as you get to verse 26, Terah lived 70 years, and he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and yet again, you have to ask the question, why Abram? Like, what is it that these people did to earn a spot on God's team? And I'm going to explain why that's the wrong question. But that's what my mind starts to think, right? Human logic and experience would tell us that it probably has to do with merit. Because I don't know about you, but when I was raised, my parents wanted me to grow up to be a man that was able to take care of a family. And so when I fell, they would help me. But ultimately, I was supposed to pick myself back up. They told me the very reality of life that, hey, nothing is free. You have to earn everything. If you want to graduate with good grades, you got to earn it. If you want to start on this team, you have to earn it. Everything in me is wired to think about earning things. Merit. Perhaps someone in this family did some great things to deserve this honor bestowed on his offspring. Or or, or logic would tell me, experience would tell me that that maybe all of the descendants in this line were actually great, great men. And we're going to find pretty soon that that actually wasn't the case either. And if that was the case, and if it actually worked that way, then these men would have been earning God's grace and favor with their works. And and I'll tell you right now that that thinking is clearly refuted in Scripture. In fact, if we start thinking that way, that people's works or obedience or, or good behavior or good deeds actually earns them a spot on God's team, then we'll find ourselves in a very, very dangerous position. And as we read through the remainder of the Bible, we see that actually earning God's favor is impossible and that God giving his favor has nothing to do with people earning it or merit, but it has everything to to do with God's grace and his sovereign plan as he works it out. And I'll quote Ephesians 1.11, all things according to the counsel of his will. All things according to the counsel of his will, this genealogy included. 
And I'm very grateful because as I was wrestling through this stuff, what you find is you open the Bible, if you know scripture uh, well, then, then perhaps you're thinking of this already. The Bible actually provides another example for us of this very same thing. And thankfully, the New Testament gives us commentary on it. And we're going to look at that as we seek to bring clarity to this question of why. Why this family? See, later on in Genesis, uh, Abram has a couple sons, right? The first one, his name was Ishmael. The second one, his name was Isaac. But God decided right off the bat that it was going to be Isaac that was the child of promise. Isaac had kids. One's name was Jacob, and one's name was Esau. And what we're going to find as we read through the story, if you guys, uh, if you guys decide to continue on the story, you're going to find that it was actually through Jacob's line, not Esau, that the promise would come. This nation of Israel will be built. So let's look at the commentary on that decision in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 9. This is what it says. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And again, right there we go. Who was the child of promise? Was it Ishmael? No, it was through Isaac. Verse 10. Not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac... Though they were not yet born, listen, this pushes back against uh, so many things that you might think. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And, and here's why it's a dilemma, right? My mind immediately goes, why? Well, they must have done something awesome to deserve this. But right here in this verse, in this picture of Jacob and, and Esau, we read that before they were born, neither of them had done anything good or bad. God made a choice not based on their efforts, not based on their good works, not based on looking down the corridor of time to see which of the two would actually choose him. It says that he chose him because he had mercy. This was so that his purpose of election might stand. And obviously, I've mentioned this before again, the human flesh pushes against this. We like to think that God bends his will to our every desire and that that we're the most important beings in the whole universe and that we're in the middle and God is rotating around us because it's all about us and and we have the singular autonomous free will in the universe and God could never make a decision like that without them earning it. And you go, no, this is how he operates. He chooses by grace to use these people to bring about The snake crusher. And this is what we find. And this is a great comfort. At times as I look at the craziness of our world, so much evil, so much junk, the world does not know God, but they're pushing and fighting against him with everything that they have. And it's so easy for me to imagine God, like, this is wrong, but playing some kind of like divine whack-a-mole, right? He's standing there and he's anxious and he's frantic and he's, he's reacting to every bad decision that humans make. And, and as he sees a mole pops up, he hits that one, another one, and he hits that one. And he's stressed out all the time as he desperately tries to maintain and uphold this world that he's created. And, and instead, here in this text, we see a God who's completely and utterly and totally in control. And what this does is it elevates God to his rightful place in our hearts as we the creature decrease and God the creator and maker increases. As I was talking about this with my wife and one of her best friends, Acacia, at at our kitchen table a couple nights ago. We're having this discussion, and and Acacia actually brought up this really good point. She said, how amazing is it that that in this world where God is not desperately trying to throw Band-Aids on everything to maintain what his purpose is, that his purpose is 100% gonna stand, nothing can thwart it, and he in his infinite wisdom is like planning things out and and making things come to pass just as he had intended. How awesome is it that that God also in his sovereignty has made it in such a way, made the world, made humans in such a way that that we can actually affect him in this way. 
The decisions we make on a daily basis, they matter, right? Our obedience, it matters. The choices you make, they matter. I love this. When we pray all over the scripture, what do we find? That God actually hears the prayers of his people. I'm reminded of Moses, the very author of Genesis, interceding on behalf of Israel and and God relenting from the disaster that he had planned for these people. And then also I think of Abram later, another hero in our story right here, this dude that has his nephew Lot we read about. And and Lot goes to live in this wicked city and the city's about to be destroyed because there's so many wicked people in there. And then Abram has this conversation with God where he's praying to him and God's listening and conversing with him. And it's so cool to think that this God who's over all things and, and sovereign over everything also uh, can, can be known by us. He's made it so that he can be known. We can have a relationship with him and that we can have a role to play in what he's doing. I'm so grateful that God didn't just say, oh, I'm just gonna save and redeem the world, but he uses people to do it and we get to know him, we get to walk alongside him as he does it. But bottom line is this, I, I wanna walk away this first section and say, man, wow, standing in awe of God who's sovereign and in control over all things. And we see that control, we see his sovereignty as we walk through this genealogy and his careful selection of man ultimately to get all the way down to Jesus in Matthew chapter one. Let's move on to the second section of our text. And we somewhat continue our theme as we look down at verses 27 through 30. Now these are the generations of Terah. I'll read it again. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. If you wrote this down, I want you to maybe see it again, but we're gonna, we're gonna label this, this portion. Uh, God uses the lowly to do the lofty. It's a truth here that is both simple and very, very encouraging. So we wanna look at these verses. We're gonna start by just recapping what we found here because this information is super important. Terah, again, three sons, Abram, Naor, and Haran. Haran had a boy named Lot, but then died in his homeland, Ur the Chaldeans. That's where this family is from, leaving Lot to be cared for by his grandpa and ultimately his uncle later on in time, if you guys know the rest of Genesis. Uh, The next information we get is that Abraham and Nahor took wives whose names were Sarai and Milcah. Sarai being Abram's half-sister and Milcah being Nahor's niece, which apparently wasn't as weird back in the day, but it is relevant for our conversation today. And then lastly, in verse 30, we read that Sarai was barren. As I was reading this, there's so much information that comes into play later on as we continue the story of Genesis But as I think about this family, it's still easy for me to sit there and be like, all right, all right, God's in control. Like, this genealogy wasn't an accident. These names didn't just happen, and we happen to see God just, I don't know, writing down the pages of Scripture. But it's still easy for my brain to go, well, well, this family, like, there must have been something special about this family, right? And obviously, Abram heard the call of God and, and responded in faith, and we read about the all throughout the Scripture. It's awesome. But as you read this passage, I start thinking about a couple things, right? I think maybe, maybe Abram was the perfect sterling example of a morally upright man. Maybe God knew that Tara was going to raise awesome children, and his, it was his parenting that ultimately led to Abram being uh, who he was in the Lord, and maybe this family was sitting back, and they were just waiting for the one true God of the world to speak to them. And right here in this section, you notice quickly that this family was pretty much just like every other family I've ever known. We already mentioned that there's some weird stuff going on in the family with Sarai and Nahor marrying like family members, and again, it was a different time. But there was some sad stuff like death and Haran dies early, right? He doesn't get to live a full life. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> 
And then, of course, there's some great things. In every family, there's, there's birthday celebrations, or in here we have marriages and, and weddings, right? There's great stuff. But in this family, like most all families, there's also some really, really bad stuff. And I want to get into that. The thing I want to mention is, is concerning their city, Ur of the Chaldeans. It's actually famous for worship of a moon god. It's a pagan idolatrous city. And before you go on thinking or jumping to conclusions that there's no way that Father Abraham's family worshipped this moon god, again, they must have stood out of the crowd. That's actually not true. In Joshua 24, chapter 2, we read, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Naor, and they served other God. So what do we see here as they're from Ur? We put that together with Joshua 24, and we can pretty much deduce that Terah, and most likely Abram, and Sarai, and, and Sarai, and Lot, and their whole family were, were probably pagan idol worshipers. They worshipped this moon god. And I just love this section of scripture because as we kind of learn about all this stuff, we, we read about the family. What we see is a family with all of its warts. We don't see the social media, Instagram family, right? We see them just as they were, their weaknesses and all. And why do we see those things? Because we're going to see that God uses the lowly to do lofty things. And this is what I mean. When I think of pagan moon god worshipers, and I think about a God that redeems things for his glory. Right there is a perfect dark backdrop against which the Lord was going to shine as he did extraordinary things to ordinary people. A dad that died early, death in the family, there's, there's sadness and a rogue nephew, which every family tends to have. But right there, there's a dark backdrop against which the Lord was going to shine to do extraordinary things to ordinary people. And then you get to that last Verse 30, it says, now Sarah was barren. You think about Sarah's barrenness, and again, if you know the rest of the story, then you guessed it. Sarah's barrenness is the perfect dark backdrop against which the Lord was going to shine and do extraordinary things. And this principle isn't just related to this family in Scripture. It's actually all over the Bible as we see this, right? You think about King David. When Samuel came to anoint a king from David's dad's family, right? His dad didn't even consider him a possibility because he was the runt of the family. He was the little guy off watching the sheep. But ultimately, God anointed him and chose him to be king over Israel. And then you have the Apostle Paul who was persecuting the church, right? Or the Apostle Peter. I don't even want, want to mention that this very pastoral staff, this whole staff of heritage is living testament to this idea right here that God uses the lowly to do the lofty. The New Testament puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 26, or chapter 1, verse 26. It says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Or again, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it, Paul's speaking of, of the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of, does anybody know the next word? Clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. God does incredible things. The surpassing power belongs to him so that the boasting might be in God and his exceeding greatness, not in man. And if we're honest right now, there, there might be a divide in the room. This truth might do two things to your heart. The first, it very well may convict you of pride. 
to hear that it's not about you and your greatness, to hear that the story is not about all about you and, and your achievements or how great you are. The story is actually about God and that God himself just told you that you're a jar of clay, that you're clay in the potter's hands and that you're not the hero of the story. God is and he always will be. And if this bothers you, because perhaps you think too highly of yourself, I do want to plead with you this morning to to repent, find the mercy and grace of God and turn from that pride because if we're honest, the Bible doesn't mince words when it considers pride. It says this, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I would beg you to not be found opposed to the Lord in this. And secondly, there's an encouragement. If God uses the weak things of the world, if God uses the foolish things of the world, if God chooses the low or the lowly things of the world to make his greatness known, then I have great news for you, church. Because as I look around this church this morning, I see a whole building full of perfect candidates for God to use to do something incredible. Guys, God is still saving and he's still rescuing, he's still redeeming and he can show his power and might in incredible ways through you. Just as he did with Abe. We're gonna move on to our last section here, verses 31 and 32. And again, we call that the journey to Canaan that ended in Haran. In these verses, we read that Terah grabbed some of his family, namely Lot and Sarai and Abram, and sent off from their homeland of Ur to go into the land of Canaan. And this is what's so cool about the scriptures is that oftentimes in one particular text, you don't really get answers to some of the questions that you have, but you can find those answers elsewhere in scripture. For example, in this verse, we don't read of of the motivation for the move. Why did they move to Canaan? We don't know yet, but we can actually find that information in the New Testament, Acts chapter 7. As a guy named Stephen was preaching his final sermon. You don't have to flip there, but just listen. In that sermon, Stephen said this, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, er, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Here's the first thing I want us to notice in verses 31 through 32. God had called Abram already while he was living in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he told him to leave his country and his kindred to go to a place that God would show him. We cheat, okay? We know because we have the rest of the Bible that this place was ultimately Canaan. But we can look at this and and figure out a couple things. It would appear then that Abram gets the call while living in Ur in this pagan idol-worshiping city. And then it seems like he told his dad about it, like he told his family, like, hey, I know we're going about our business, worshiping sin, is literally the name of this moon god, but I heard God, I think the one true God, I don't know how this conversation went, telling me to get up and go. And it appears, as we read in verse 31, 31, Terah took Abram and Lot and his son Haran, his grandson, left. It appears that Terah, Abram's dad, caught wind of the vision, got excited about it, and then they embark on this journey together. And it's this happy moment. It's like, all right, let's go do what God called us to do. To Canaan we go. The journey to Canaan begins. But in one verse you read right here in verse 31, uh, the family never made it to Canaan, at least not yet. Not in Terah's lifetime. 
And we don't know exactly why this happened, but it is pretty fun to speculate. One possibility is that the journey would no doubt prove to be very long. Terah was old, so maybe as they journeyed up through Haran on their way to Canaan, Terah gets old, he has arthritis in his knees and his hips and his ankles, and he has the walker, and he's tired of this journey, and Abe is walking so fast, and, and he's like, dude, i got to stop, i got to calm down, I can't go any further. That's a possibility. Maybe he was unable or unfit due to infirmities and in age. Or another possibility, and this is great, as I listen to Philippi's teaching, they taught on this last week, uh, that one of the pastors there, Cody, actually brought up this point. He said, maybe they were on a purposeful trip up to Haran. This was like a detour. If you look at a map, historically people think that Ur is somewhere like over here, Haran's up here, and Canaan's down here. So it's like this huge arcing rainbow. And you're like, why in the world did they make it to Haran? One possibility is this, right? That maybe it was a planned detour. And Cody mentioned this. He said, Haran, actually, uh, we know that was a, a moon god-worshipping city as well. They worshiped the same god as the people in Ur of the Chaldeans. So he said, maybe they were on some moon god religious conference or something. Who knows what brought them to Haran in the first place. But maybe it was a purposeful detour. Or maybe they did just simply pass through the land of Haran trying to find out where God was calling them to exactly. And then they ended up liking it there. They're like, man, this, this place seems sweet. It seems like a good place for us to land and raise our kids. But either way, there's some symbolism here in that Tara, the dad, had heard of the promised land, had heard of the call of God on Abram's life to go out to the land that he would show them, but ultimately never got to see it or enter into it. One Bible commentator said this, speaking of people nowadays on their journey of faith or a spiritual journey, it says, many now, just like Tara, make it to Haran and yet fall short of Canaan. They're not far from the kingdom of God and yet never come thither. I think... Most of us in this room could attest that the life of faith, the life of following Jesus is a long, arduous journey that costs a lot. And the reality is that many start down the path. I can't even tell you how many conversations I've had with cousins or, or friends that weren't believers in Jesus, but they know that I work at a church, so they start asking me questions about the Bible, and they're, they're intrigued, and they're, they're on this pursuit of, of spiritual enlightenment or whatever, and they're trying to figure out if the Bible or Jesus fits in with what they want to believe. So, so they're kind of inquiring about the faith, they start down the path, maybe asking questions, but only to go a different route and, and not come to saving faith in, in Jesus Christ. There's a couple of parables that help us bring clarity to this, right? Perhaps, uh, perhaps as the seed of the gospel was, was thrown out, perhaps it gets choked out by the cares of the world, right? Jesus talked about that in a parable. Perhaps they're unwilling to give up their lives for the glory of God. Or perhaps they are just get tired and they quit along the journey because it really is hard. And, or maybe they just never fully surrender to Jesus. And, and again, they fail to put their faith and trust completely in Christ and His finished work on the cross on their behalf. Whatever the reason, I don't know, but I'm reminded of Luke 14. And, and we're almost getting to a close, so hang with me. Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. If you want to read with me, you can. If you want to listen, feel free. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. And by the way, Jesus had a pretty awesome evangelism technique. If, if you're ever surrounded by great crowds, maybe don't try this method. I don't know. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The journey is a long one. It costs a lot. Verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, 
Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all will see it and begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, or what king going out to encounter another king in war will sit down first and will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Guys, again, it's a long journey from Ur all the way to Canaan. Lest we end up like Tara, maybe you're in this place and you're seeking and searching for answers and you're like, man, I just need to know about this. There's only one way to make it to the quote unquote promised land of Canaan in our symbol or our metaphor here. And it's this, to cast yourself completely and utterly upon the grace and mercy of God. You're not counting on your own leg strength to get you to Canaan to salvation. You are counting upon Jesus You're pressing on, empowered by His grace, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes to indwell the believer when we put our faith in Him, and then we're rejoicing in the fact that Jesus endured and that Jesus gave it all for us. Again, guys, this is the the last sermon in our series. And, And while this is a good place for us to close, it feels awkward still. Because what we find here is that we've been introduced to new characters, we've gotten a brief history on those characters, we found out that this family is just a normal family with warts and all. The journey was started, that later stalled as a call from God was obeyed for a while and then put on the back burner. It's like a cliffhanger ending, right? Because so much new information right before we lead up to chapter 12. And then we as a church are just going to sit back and we're going to be moving on to something else. But I want to close by just encouraging us with this. As we read through this and we've kind of dissected so many things, we've wrestled with, with hefty truth and encouraged and challenged I want to just say this, that as we're here left in suspense, perhaps there's excitement, perhaps confusion, or even there's some questions that some of you might have with some of these characters that we've been introduced to. Maybe, maybe as I mentioned, Abram and Lot and Sarai's barrenness, you go, what about Abram? What is God going to do with him? Or what's, what part does Lot play in the story? Or why is Sarah's barrenness mentioned? I would encourage you, even though we're stopping as a church preaching through this, I would encourage you to read through this. Genesis 12 through 50, with everything that we've learned up to this point, everything we've walked through, the rest of the story is going to be that much sweeter. And here's the cool part. And I want to end with this. Ryan, you guys can come on up. But as we, as we finish this text, I think it's super cool to take a minute to just look back and Starting with Genesis 1-1, the hero of the story was God. We've been hearing about him since the very beginning. The fall, right? We see the wickedness of man and we see God's grace. And God, again, is the hero of the story. Cain killing Abel. God is right there and he's good and he's gracious and he's powerful and he's in control. Over and over again, as we've looked back and and studied these, these texts, chapters 1 through 11, we've seen over and over again that Genesis tells us and reveals a great, tells us about and reveals a great God. And we've gotten to stand in awe and worship the God that we read about in Genesis 1 through 11. The cool thing is this, if you decide to read on from 12 through 50, it's just going to be more of the same. New characters introduced, new trials, new suffering, new pain, new triumphs, but all throughout the whole thing, everything you read, it's going to be pointing to how great and glorious our God is as his name is exalted as he carries out his sovereign plan and purposes. Let's pray with you guys. Lord Jesus, we uh, just come before you, humbled by your greatness this morning humbled that you would call us and use us
humble that we get to stand here in your presence and in a second offer up praise to you and give you the, like ascribe the worth that you're worthy of. Lord, even as we sing two more songs, as we lift our hands in worship, would it move your heart, Lord? Would you be blessed as your people give you the praise? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.